there is a force so powerful that it can transform industries, disrupt the status quo, bring people together across time and space, and redefine human experience. That force is innovation. And in today's connected world, innovation is everything. We believe innovation is the engine of differentiation and the driver of success. And that value is created in the intelligence of things. We believe in the power of connected intelligence to build a brighter tomorrow. That's why we help the world's biggest brands and smallest startups across every industry bring intelligent things to life. So free your imagination, adopt the Maverick paradigm, and together, we'll change the world. Flextronics, tomorrow starts today. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mahal, for the introduction. I, I appreciate it. Um, it's kind of exciting to talk about innovation in a connected world today. Um, the amount of innovation that's going on in this world and the amount of disruption, uh, whether it's product disruption or business model disruption or really how people go to market is just a, moving at a pace that's significantly faster than anything we've seen before. So it's a really exciting time to be, be part of technology. Before I talk a little bit more about what is really close to us, um, which is really innovation in a connected world, I want to talk a little bit about Flextronics, just so you can get a little bit of a perspective of where I'm coming from when I talk about some of my comments and observations. But uh, we're about a $26 billion company, and think of us as a design, engineering, supply chain solutions company. So we have built things that you drive in that are in your house right now that are in your bag that are in your in the offices and uh, we do it at a significant scale we have about 200,000 people worldwide we have 50 million square feet uh, somewhere around the world um, we have big innovation centers all the way into not only just the scale that we operate into and into working with many different industries and, and being able to, to scale large companies but we also work all the way into innovative companies. So we have a million square feet just here in Silicon Valley where we produce probably more startup products than any company in the world. And we see more innovations coming in as a result of being right in the middle of Silicon Valley. But we also have three quarters of a million square feet in Israel. Um, we're just opening up an operation, uh, an office, um, not an office, but actually a, a design prototyping center here in San Francisco and New York next month. Um, we're getting ready to open up in Boston. We already have operations in Shanghai, Beijing. So we actually have uh, attachments into the innovation centers as well. So we just, we just see a lot. And if you think about what this global scale does for us, it gets us great insight into what's going on in the world. Each one of these panes represent a business segment where we have more than a billion dollars of revenue. And what that means, when you have a billion dollars of revenue in any one segment, we typically have 30 to 50 customers in each one of these different segments. So whether it's healthcare or automotive or industrial or home appliance, we typically are the largest supplier to virtually every one of those customers. So in telecom and datacom, we're either the largest or second largest customer to Cisco or Alcatel-Lucent or Nokia Siemens Networks may even be one of the top two in, in companies like Huawei um, internationally. We are the largest supplier into Lenovo. So we actually have this unique access into many different, different companies. What's interesting about that access is when you, when you have the access into many different customers within an industry and then many different industries, you can triangulate around what are the innovations that are occurring. And whether the innovations are in supply chain or whether in geographic, strategies or whether it's innovation strategies, when you're seeing and building the new products, when you're actually moving these customers to different geographic regions, when you're actually seeing the supply chain strategies, you can actually see, understand them within an industry, but then you can also apply them across other industries. So we think about some of the best ideas we get for helping our automotive customers and medical customers come out of the consumer industry. Because very often what's happening in the consumer industry 
is actually what's what may be applicable in automobiles or or healthcare, you know, farther down the road. People a lot of talk a lot about digital health. A lot of those innovations are coming out of the consumer. People talk a lot about automotive um, and the connected car. I mean, a lot of those innovations are coming out of out of automotive. So we get this kind of unique perspective. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of understanding in terms of the kind of things we see. We, we actually have access to so much information and so many different strategies and so many different companies that it gives us a really, really cool perspective. So let me back up a little bit and move more into like a 100,000 foot view. And if you think about what I think about the industrial age from 1750 to 1850, productivity started to accelerate in the world. And things like the locomotive, or the loon, or the cotton gin, these were all big innovations that were now starting to come into our society, and they started to attach to a variety of people. When we got to the modern age, which we think about from 1850 to 1970, there were even more innovations that actually impacted even more people. So a lot of this, and the productivity doubled after 40 years. You know, you think about the telephone or the airplane or many innovations that you can think about during that, that period. If you think about the innovation, information age, you think about the computer and the internet. And, innov and, and growth and productivity per capita increased again, where it doubled every 25 years. And if we think about where we are today, we think we're in the intelligence age. We think it's a new era where many, many billions, in fact, of smart co connected devices are, understand, are interfacing with their environment, they're collecting information, they're controlling their, their system, they're monitoring, they're adapting, they're influencing, they're collecting data, and they're analyzing, and they're adjusting. It's a new world where all these billions of connected devices are now attaching into the marketplace to give us data. And needless to say, the amount of people that they attach into has gone exponentially up. And at the same time, the whole world's population has continued to increase at a relatively fierce rate relative to the last uh, 10,000 years. So you got all these factors happening at the same time. So it's these intelligence of these things, these things in the end marketplace, these end nodes that have to connect back. They have to communicate data and software back into the environment to, in order to really be able to optimize their system. And I know you've probably seen the stat like this very often, about 50 billion connected devices. But what's interesting is actually the next comment, which is really built around 7.1 trillion TAM. And to put it in perspective, it's like 82 trillion TAN total world economy. So it's a significant part, and it's meaningful, about how we move forward. If you think about this IoT environment, you think about the developers that are going to drive the IoT adoption. The amount of developers in 2014, last year that we just finished, was estimated to be about 300,000. You look into 2020, just five years from now, you're talking about 4.5 million. So not only do you have technology, but you also have developers that are going to be using that technology to create solutions uh, at a very, very rapid pace. What's also interesting is when you step back and look at it from a very high level standpoint, the opportunity is quite enormous. So it's not just that the fact that we have technology and developers, but you can actually solve real problems. So this is data out of the McKinsey Institute, which said that the potential global impact of these IoT devices in these different industries by 2025 are significant. You know, you think about like an automobile, just the connected car being able to avoid accidents, even if it was reduced, the vehicle damage was reduced by 25%, it's a $200 billion potential impact. And that's only if 25% of the accidents could be protected. And think about people saving lives, and it has other implications. But this is like what we would, in the manufacturing environment, call just like a pure, pure, pure scrap of society that could be literally a huge impact. Think about healthcare. Having, you know, if you were able to diagnose the body and, and manage the body in a better way, if you got 10 to 20% reduction in chronic diseases, you can actually impact the economy by about $2 trillion. So what's interesting about not only the availability of technology and the power of technology and what it's enabling us to do, but the problems it can solve are significant and they're valuable to go solve. And that's why you know this is going to move into a more and more uh, aggressive way of, of bringing it into the marketplace so we can all use it. 
So without doubt, the world is changing. And as I think about how we like to look at the marketplace and use the power of our insight and the data that we have, we have to not only think about the, the 100,000 put view, but we got to think more like, you know, what's the current macro trends and environment that we need to think about? Because these are the problems that we need to solve today. And if I think about some of the things that we think about at Flextronics that we're really working on, we think about middle classes developing all around the world. We see emerging markets coming up. We see a growth in population. As middle classes develop, they become, demand becomes more distributed around the world. As demand becomes more distributed around the world and as those middle class have more purchasing power, you have more and more product customizations in those marketplaces, which creates a need for more and more complex supply chains. The need for real-time information that I'm gonna talk about later is directly attributed to the fact that you have to have a more sophisticated supply chain to meet the demands of the people. And when I think about the product power or the power of the consumer coming up in these developing marketplaces, very often Western companies used to make products that used to go into emerging markets. But if you think about a product we designed three years ago for a set-top box manufacturer in China, the first thing they wanted in terms of capability in that set-top box was a karaoke capability. So as those demands, as, a, as the purchasing power goes up, as this demand becomes more distributed around the world, you have a significantly higher level of product customization. The minute you start doing regional manufacturing, you have more nodes in your supply chain, you have more complexity in your supply chain, your inventory is more distributed, you have a higher cost to manage that inventory, and it becomes a, an increasing challenge that we have to go solve. Things like the growth of Asian OEMs is a huge, huge driver. Not only is it a driver just from powerful new companies that we have to think about that are going to influence us, but we actually have to think about what are the impacts in terms of the product life cycles, in terms of the competitiveness of, from a pricing standpoint, in terms of innovation that might come at it a different way. All these are driving huge um, factors. You know, you think about the amount of the PC business that has now gone into Asia manufacturing or the amount of cell phones that have gone into Asia manufacturing. You know, the most recent um, one being Motorola through Google is now owned by Lenovo and is the number three brand in the world today. So a huge factor in terms of us thinking about how do we run our business? How do we think about what are the, what are the problems that we need to solve within a big complex manufacturing company like Flextronics? And we also think about faster product life cycles. We think about more disruptive products. The OEMs of tomorrow are not the same OEMs of the past. Think about OEMs like Google or Microsoft or Amazon. All these companies are heading rapidly into more and more hardware products. Things like companies like Alibaba and Baidu, we now view as one of the most important targets for us to penetrate in terms of providing manufacturing for hardware products. And the reason is, is because the, the ability to provide hardware content software solutions to consumers is how you create the optimized consumer environment. You know, Apple proved that in 2007 with the iPhone. They came out with content and apps and software and hardware all integrated in a relatively seamless way. You contrast that to the most recent phone that was a hit, which is the Razer. I don't know if anybody remembers the Razer from Motorola. Huge hit. Immediately went to number one market share. And the only reason it went to one, one, number one market share is because it was the coolest phone. It was the actual coolest hardware devices. There was no real content. Nobody even knows what software ran on it. But when Apple came out with an integrated hardware software content play, it changed the world and it changed how we think about going to consumers with a value-added proposition. So new OEMs are coming into the marketplace. And as these new OEMs come into the marketplace, they're software guys. And they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of opportunity to bring optimized solutions into the marketplace. CSCR, many people don't think about. CSCR is consumer social and environmental responsibility. And it's important to us because we have 200,000 people. You know, when you have 200,000 people, you actually make a difference in the world in terms of being a global citizen. So it's important to us, it's important to our brand. But if you think about the brand we protect for the amount of different customers we have, which is roughly 1,000 different customers, in a world of an unbelievable transparency where data and information travels extremely fast to many people very rapidly, you know, whether it's Twitter or Snapchat or anything else, you can imagine the brand implications of a completely transparent society anywhere in the world. It's a huge, huge consideration for us going forward. And then there's the Internet of Things. You know, I talked about the Internet of Things. 
Everybody calls it the Internet of Things. I'm actually not sure why if I think about our next generation. You know, I called it the intelligence of things. And the Internet's been around for 30 years. You know, what's the innovation? I mean, it gets better and stronger and more powerful and can put more data, but what's actually changing the world is the end connected nodes. It's the intelligent end nodes that are now driving massive amounts of data that are coming into the marketplace that we can then use and analyze and optimize around that's actually going to create the change in the world. So these are all things that, that we think about, about how we need to drive our business strategies. <clears throat> At the same time, you've got these huge influence from really powerful uh, technology forces. So think about simultaneously you have information that's free. I mean, it's basically free. If anybody wants to know anything, just Google it. And it's immediate. It has information free and immediate. You think about mobile devices and the ubiquity of mobile devices. We're up to about three and a half billion smartphones in the world. Think about when we get, in another couple of years, we expect to be at five billion smartphones. And just think about the power that it enables in terms of all these interconnected devices where they're communicating to the smartphone. But the platform of the phone is already there. And then you think about the cloud. It's almost like everybody has access to massive computing power. And if you're a company using the cloud, the costs are insanely low and continue to drop at a, at a rapid rate. So you kind of have unlimited scale. In terms of size and the amount of things you want to put in there, you have you know, massive power and, and you have this you know, minimal cost. You know, an interesting antidote, I heard a piece of data just this week. The um, Citrix did a survey in 2012, and they asked, and what they found out is that 51% of the people believe that if there was a severe weather, that it would actually impact the performance of the cloud. It's 2012. It's crazy data. Online channels. You know what else is going on now? You have online channels. You have access to online channels. How many of you guys know Xiaomi over in China? So, as a $45 billion market cap, number one cell phone manufacturer in China, number three worldwide, it only started a few years ago. What did they do? They skipped the whole carrier system. They went right to the channel and had a different manufacturing model. So they actually used the channel to create disruption. And, here, and within a several years, they, get, they ended up with a $50 billion market cap. And it was all built around the availability of the channel. So when people start businesses today, when think about inter, interfacing these end nodes into the system, they think about all these different things. There's a massive utilization of existing infrastructure that you can just go build on. You know, Uber wants to go disrupt the taxi system. Well, everybody's got the cell phone in their pocket. Google Maps already exists. The power of the cloud is unbelievably cheap. And they have social to communicate the message. It's an unbelievably, creates unbelievably powerful disruptive models. So without doubt, power is shifting to the consumer. And if you, Uber wants to disrupt the taxi market, which has been around for decades in this existing form, highly regulated, uh, very few players, very strong positions, unionized, all the, all the kind of characteristics of, the, of an industry that never evolved and changed and adapted to the new world. And the consumers came out and said, I have the power now, I'm going to change. And these, these, this power of, of the consumers is, is very disruptive for moving forward. So if you think about it, so whether it's the relentless, so I went kind of quick on that one, whether it's the relentless development of the world that we talked about in terms of high level of population growth and, and more innovations with more people using the innovations, driving productivity, whether it's the, the current competitive environment, the current macro environment, or whether it's the, this sheer explosion of nodes that we're seeing in the marketplace, and it simultaneously have this unbelievable implosion in costs. You know, there's another data point I heard this week, that the average greeting card that has a chip in it, the average greeting card has more processing power than the entire allied forces did in 1945. <laughs> it's just like incredible. So all that happened in one lifetime. And the speed of change is actually increasing substantially since then. So there's just no doubt the world is changing. When we also think about the implications for Flextronics, and we think about there's two very, very important um, initiatives that we have that we need to drive across all the industries, across all the products. 
I want to talk about each of those two. The first time is real-time information. So you think about this faster, quicker, more disruptive world that I'm talking about. If you don't have real-time information, it's hard to survive. And it's almost necessary in a connected world. We think about that data, it needs to be live, it needs to be fast, it needs to be intelligent. You know, we look at around at the legacy ERP systems that probably many of you have worked with. They're not built on the architecture that you need to, to be real time, to be able to handle a faster, quicker world. We, were look, we looked across that and we said, boy, it's gonna be really, really tough for us to adapt and be agile in this, in this newer, more, more competitive world unless we have systems that can give us real time data and information. And part of what we did in order to solve that problem around legacy software systems not having the, the flexibility or the interest maybe to even go into real time information we actually spun off our own company called Elementum, which we spun off into a, se a, second, a separate company. And it's a SaaS pay supply chain solutions company. And what it does is use real, real time data. Everything's mobile. It's multi tenant, multi enterprise. It's highly collaborative. You know, you guys talk about using APIs to get to the data that you need to be able to make decisions. It's built on, taking, on using APIs to get to the data from multiple companies to look at a comprehensive supply chain, look across industries and optimize. That when your inventory is spread out all over the world, it has the ability to look at those inventories and where they're located around the world and where they're in transport using connections into multiple companies that go into one system, you know, through APIs, and be able to actually optimize. This is, this is the world that we have to have. We're moving our entire company to real-time information. You guys talked about robots earlier today. The amount, we're, we're doubling the amount of automation every single year at Flextronics, have been doubling it for about five years now. When we think about robots, we want those robots to be feeding us data on a real-time basis. This is, this is the company that we need to be in order to compete into the new world, and it creates a massive opportunity for those companies that can enable data to now move into companies in a real-time way. This is a good piece of data from Aberdeen. It talks about real-time data, but then if you go add visualization onto that real-time data, you get a 67% improvement in operating cost. So as a company, we have roughly a 6% gross margin, which I know for you software guys is like really crazy, <laughs> but it's a lot of revenue. <laughs> And it's a lot of free cash flow, I'll add, not to pick on the software guys, but. Um, <laughs> um, but we have 67%, there's 67% greater operational efficiency as a result of taking real-time data and putting it into visual, visualized way. If you go down, we have what we call a situation room. So if you go down, you know, 101 here to 237, um, we have a big room, which we call the situation room. This picture really doesn't do it justice, but we are driving all the data into this room to be real-time information. These are all screens that are interactive, so you can touch them and drill down into, into data, and it's basically visualizing what we have at Flextronics across, the entire, across our entire system. So not only are we trying to drive to real-time and mobile to be able to respond to this quicker, faster world, but we actually have to be, be able to look across it and say, how do, I, how do I run better? Not, don't, not only just how do I react better, but how do I run better? And looking at this data and, and have it in a central control kind of format allows us the opportunity to do that. And our real room is like five times this size. So it kind of looks like CSI or something, or like one of those cop shows that have all the cool, the cool things. It's, it's kind of what it looks like. But it's how we think about um, competing in the world, creating competitive advantage for our customers, and almost even doing what's necessary as you get to this faster, quicker world. There's a second initiative that I said that we work on really, really hard and we think about. And I kind of called it, you know, we design hardware for software. Kind of a weird way to do it. But the reality is, is software is where a huge part of the value is created, but you need hardware to get there. You can't very often, I mean, you've got 50 billion connected nodes, I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a lot of hardware involved in this game. And there might be a lot of software and data 
recurring revenues, services, all, all those kind of things. But you need the hardware to get at the data very often in the future. And, and it's a lot of how we think about it because we're the hardware guy. So this is a, a picture of Chromecast. <clears throat> so I don't know how many people know Chromecast. It's a little dongle, a lot of people. So think about Chromecast. So Chromecast is by Google. We did all the design, the manufacturing, and we scaled this. So we did all this. We're the exclusive provider of this product now for a couple years. Now, why did Google come to us? Well, it's because we have all this hardware expertise. What does Google want? Do they actually want Chromecast? Or do they really want, I mean, what they really want is they want more eyeballs for longer periods of time on the screen, on a different size screen. Because the monetization of their system, where there's more value created, is actually in in getting those eyeballs on those screen for a longer period of time. It's the content in the software where the monetization occurs. The hardware is just a vehicle to get there. I think they sell this for $39. So very often, customers today are actually software customers that are looking for hardware solutions, not because they want to be in hardware, but because they need a vehicle to get to the software and the data. They want to get to the data. So this is a lot of what we do. So as we think about moving into this age of intelligence, we think about we're the guy that has to provide the hardware to enable the software so that we can get there, so they can get there quicker, faster than they could, than they could otherwise. If they're going to start from scratch and build a competence to go, to go do this, it's just going to take them longer to get to the monetization value. And this is in a faster, quicker world, you just don't have time. So you want more and more collaborative partnerships. Um, like we have with, with Google. So we've actually formalized this in our company. You know, we think about that it's like the intelligence of things ecosystem. So in today's world, if you think about that problem, about faster, quicker, and more disruptive, more Asian competition, all these kind of things, you have to have a system that enables development to occur quicker, faster, more efficiently, and at a lower cost. So we think about the whole process as being different today to build hardware than it ever was in the past. It's about actually cultivating innovation. It's actually accelerating innovation. It's actually sourcing innovation. We actually run our own accelerator down in, down in Milpitas. We work with venture capitalists um, to be part of the system by which they find new innovations. We're working with universities. You know, I mentioned we're putting up little labs here and in New York City. Um, we're working, we're close on London. We're getting ready to do something in Boston. We already have something in Beijing and Shanghai. All these kind of things are ways to source innovation because in a faster, quicker world, you have to find the innovation and you need to bring it in. You need to have multiple enterprises collaborating in a collective innovation way to actually achieve the outcome. And we developed the smart components that actually enable this connectivity, these $50 billion 50 billion devices out there, they have a lot of common characteristics. You got to power them. They have to have connectivity. You have to interface with them. You know, you got to swipe at it, or you got to push an LCD to screen, or you got to talk to it. I mean, there's a human machine interface. There's a lot of these things are very, very common functionality. And a lot of those fun functionality we do. And we have systems and processes to actually find these innovations. We have 2,500 design engineers that we use, and we have seven centers of excellence where we work to, to create the underlying core components that allow this intelligence to occur in end devices. And when Whirlpool calls up and says, I'm real good at designing tumbling and heating and heat exhaust and all these kind of things that they're real good at, and they say, I, I now want to have a wireless module that connects to the iPhone so I can tell my customer that the load is ready, take it out of the dryer, or turn it on, whatever it is, they can accelerate innovation by coming to someone like us who has a core set of component technologies that we can rapidly implement, all leveraged on our scale of $25 billion of spend to get to a quicker, faster. And it's way more efficient than be sitting in Wisconsin and hiring wireless engineers from scratch to go compete against LG and Samsung. We also identify and leverage the technology across industries. So we also look for how can we cross leverage industries? You know, how do we go to the automotive guys and say, hey, we find these consumer technologies that are really cool that you can apply in, in the automotive industry. It's a very unique component. But all this is accelerating innovation and the ability for 
different kind of customers like the big OEMs, the software guys, to create new solutions. And then, of course, we commercialize it, which is what we do best. You know, we MPI it, we build it, we scale it, we ship it around the world, we repair it, we do whatever it takes. But this intelligence of things ecosystem is a huge part of what you need to enable. But a lot of the messaging that I'm talking about here is, is really a cross-industry, cross-enterprise application where real-time information is a requirement. So it's almost like there's this entire system of intelligence that's necessary to take the world forward, to really meet the possibilities of the productivity, to enable how we live, work, and play, and optimize it. Hardware is part of that component, as is software, as is the data. You need to take the data, we have to do analytics, and we have to visualize it to be able to make best management decisions. It's almost like you have a comprehensive system of intelligence that really is going to be able to get at the opportunities that exist in the world today and to get at that pie chart that I talked about earlier about how to realize some of the value that we can create. So it's a really exciting time in the technology industry. It's more dimensions than there's ever been before. There's more economies that we have to tap into. There's more collaboration across multiple enterprises that we have to deal with, and everything has to be built on real time. We thought it was appropriate, thought it was a really interesting message as you think about how you further develop, develop software and APIs and moving data and, and getting data, and how to apply it into this faster, quicker world. It's a huge opportunity going forward, and we're actually thrilled about the opportunity to be in the middle of technology in today's world and enabling it. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for your attention and uh, enjoy the conference.